And then probably the best option when it comes to security would be fiber optics. Now fiber optics, they transmit digital signals using light impulses, not electricity like our UDP, or excuse me, UTP, STP, or our coax, right? That works off electricity going down the copper wire. No copper wire when it comes to fiber optics. So because of that, it's immune to that EMI and RFI, that electromagnetic interference and radio interference. So this is pretty secure. There are some downsides to it though, right? It is a little harder to work with. That should be some cons, uh, a little bit more expensive, but being immune to EMI and RFI is a plus. Now the cable itself, uh, there's a couple different versions we can get. We can have single mode or multi-mode. You may see it SMF and MMF, right? Single mode fiber, multi-mode fiber. Now the difference, the main difference in them is the number of light rays that they can carry. All right, being multi-mode, uh, you can actually put more light rays inside of there because it is a thicker uh, piece of uh, conducting material, glass or plastic. So it is a little bit larger. Uh, well, actually it's quite a bit larger, probably about five times larger, six times larger than uh, single mode fiber. Single mode fiber is a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of fiber, but it is extremely fast and you can only put one light ray in there. You use single mode fiber usually for longer runs Right? It can get, go up to uh, many more kilometers than multi-mode. So single mode is usually for longer runs. It can transmit data faster as well because there's not as much bouncing going on inside of the, the, uh, the, the, the medium itself. Now multi-mode is usually for shorter distances, maybe between buildings. Because it can carry more data but not, maybe not as fast because we can put more light rays in there, right? If I had a bigger tube, I could bounce a light ray off the top. At the same time, I could bounce one off the bottom. Same time, I could bounce one off the side, maybe change the angle a little bit so I could fit more data inside of that cable as it's going down, as the light beams bounce off the sides of the uh, glass or the plastic as it makes its way to the other end. Single mode being smaller doesn't have as much of that bounce. That's what makes it a little bit faster. Or I should say it may not have, I can't say it doesn't have as much, but the bounces are shorter, they're smaller, so it can go a little faster. Does that make sense? That might clear it up a little bit better. Now again, those pros and cons of fiber optics. Pros, immune to EMI RFI. That's a good. Um, it can transmit up to 40 kilometers. That's a pretty good little run, about 25 miles, right? And then we got to hit something that will repeat that signal for us or, you know, if we're in some type of data converter or whatever your infrastructure is. So that's, that's pretty good. Uh, it's harder to tap into a fiber optic cable, right? I can't necessarily just, you know, pull back the coating for fiber optic cable and clamp on some alligator clips and get that electromagnetic, uh, get that signal off of there, right? Because there's no electrons. It's, it's glad it's, it's, it's light. So I can't really, it's harder to tap into. You got to get to the ends to make that happen. Uh, cons, it's difficult to install. It is kind of hard to work with. Uh, I've done it a couple of times and you have to have a really steady hand, especially that single mode fiber, because it's tiny, tiny, tiny. I like the, it's smaller than a human hair, right? Uh, but you got, you know, you're working with it. You may have uh, some magnifying glasses if you need, but you know, working with that is, is, is pretty difficult. It's more expensive than twisted pair, probably more expensive than coax as well. Troubleshooting equipment for fiber optics is going to be more expensive, right? It's specialized equipment. So you have to spend more money for this equipment and it could be harder to troubleshoot. Um, you may not be able to identify where the break is, right? Because it breaks easier than twisted pair. Twisted pair is copper, so I'd have to sit there for 
a while and bend it and bend it and bend it and bend it and really put some stress on it before that copper is ever going to break. Uh, fiber optics, I could bend it so I could tie it in a knot and pull and snap it. All right, Five, uh, twisted pair, it won't snap. Right, I can tie it in a knot and pull. It's not good for it, and if I did that a couple times, it might break. But fiber optics, as soon as I do it one time and pull tight, it's going to snap inside. You might not see it, you might not even hear it, but it's going to crack inside there. And as soon as that happens, light's going to start escaping. You're not going to get your data. So that's a con as well for fiber optics. Now, what about network access control? Let's talk a little bit about firewalls and proxies and what they can do for us when it comes to securing our network. So for firewalls, we've mentioned it a couple times. I think I mentioned it when I talk about the defense in depth, right? We want a perimeter firewall. We could have a firewall on our subnet. We could have a firewall on our host. But quite simply, they block or allow, again, depending on how you want to look at it, traffic in or out of your network. Now I added something in there that you may not have caught that time. Because I've been talking about, well, firewalls protect us, they protect us. They can also keep traffic from leaving your network. There's a term you might need to know, spillage. All right, so that is proprietary information that maybe somebody intentionally or unintentionally is trying to get outside of your network. There's trying to have spillage, maybe incidental, and you have sensitive information get out. Firewalls can help stop that. Malicious intent, if traffic is destined for a particular subnet, if somebody's trying to sell uh, government secrets to another country, that firewall could prevent that traffic from leaving because you could set those rules up and say, well, traffic can't be destined for this subnet and it won't allow it to leave. So they can block and allow traffic in and going out of your network. Now we have a couple different types of firewalls. We have packet filtering. These are based on IP address and port. Easiest ones, maybe, it depends on how you look at it, to work with. You set up these ACLs like I've been talking about. You set up these rules. You're coming in from a particular subnet. You're bound for port whatever. Okay, you're allowed, but you're coming in from this uh, unfriendly country and it doesn't matter what port you're trying to hit, I'm going to block that traffic. You're not coming in, you're not allowed into the network. Now we could also have stateful pack inspection, which looks at the rules and the context of how it got there. Not the content, but how it got there. Usually stateful packet inspection is something originated from the inside. Maybe you requested a web page from a web server. So you sent that request so the traffic originated on the inside of the network. When it starts to come back, a stateful packet inspection can say, oh wait a second, okay, I'm looking at the context of this and I see that this actually originated in here, so this must be trusted traffic, come on in, everything's fine. You can also have an application layer firewall. That's the other two, packet filtering and stateful packet inspection, plus based on the payload of the data. So now we can do a deep inspection and to see actually what's in there. Remember I said to prevent spillage. If we had an application layer firewall and it could look at the content and it says, wait a minute, this has some of those key words, some of this content is not supposed to leave the network and deny that traffic from ever leaving. Now, there are some, some topologies when it comes to firewalls as well. And I've seen all three of these uh, and, and, and I really can't tell you right now with certainty which one would be uh, more popular than the other ones. Uh, a dual homed firewall, all right, we have the public network over here and the private network over here, and we may have a router. That's normally how it's set up. That's probably how you have it set up in your home. But let's say that router is, uh, we put a firewall in there. Let's say we just take the router out of the equation right now. And the information comes through. Here's our public network. It hits the firewall. 
So we have a connection here on this side of the firewall, and we also have a connection on this side of the firewall. It's dual homed. It's touching two separate networks, a public network and a private network. Now what about a screen firewall? Well, we could screen the firewalls as well and have a, a firewall here and a firewall here. And now we have this empty space in here. Well, this empty space, which we're going to talk about in a second, is a security zone called a DMZ, the Demilitarized Zone. And what we put in there are public-facing services, but still under our control. Because this is not really a public network, but it's not super private yet either. Because st we still have two firewalls here. So we have a firewall on the public side and to the DMZ, a firewall on the DMZ and to the private side. We could also have a screened subnet firewall. Now this is one firewall with public connection, private connection, but it also has a connection off for the DMZ. So it's got an extra port and it's actually labeled DMZ because it knows you can put things in there. You're gonna have different security zones. So let's talk about those security zones like our private LAN. Easy one to understand. That's our network. That's our network on the inside. Right? That's our private 192.168 addressing that we talked about a little earlier, or the 10 network. That's our network. We want to secure that as much as possible. Then we have the public zone, totally unsecure, unregulated, if you will, as far as what security comes. We can't trust anything out there. Don't trust the public zone. So we have the public zone and we have our private zone. And then remember, in between there, we have our DMZ where we could put public facing services like web servers, the load balancer we talked about earlier. We could put a load balancer there and our web servers down here. They're public facing. They have to have public IP addresses so people can reach them, but they're still under our control. It's part of our infrastructure, but I don't want them on the inside because let's think about that for a second. Let's say I have a web server, a public DNS and, um, uh, email server out there. Well, now I have port 80, port 53, and port 25. If I have a firewall right here with a DMZ, I can leave those ports open here, but what can I do on the public side now? Right, I can shut those ports off. I'm lowering my attack surface. I'm lowering my security footprint. I'm making myself smaller, harder to attack. We talked about the Swiss cheese. I'm plugging those holes up, right? I don't want Swiss cheese. I don't want all the holes. I want a solid piece. So when that attack comes in, that's all they're hitting. They're not getting through those holes, those ports that are attached to those services, those doors that may be open. And then a proxy server. Proxy servers, they have uh, a multitude of roles, but they usually do something on your behalf. Right? If you have a proxy, somebody is working or doing something on your behalf, a proxy server does that. Now, it can do a couple different things uh, when it comes to security. First off, it can hide your internal network. So we can have a proxy server sitting on the perimeter. We could have a router here still. And what happens is all the traffic goes through the proxy. And when it comes out the other end, what everybody in the world sees is just the proxy. They don't see our internal network. They don't see all this traffic back here because the traffic's hitting this proxy server. And now it's masking what's on the inside. So that gives us a sense of security. It can also do content filtering. I used to work at an elementary school and we had a proxy server for this exact purpose. We did not want elementary students looking up adult websites or, or, or questionable websites, bomb building, guns, violence, things like that, right? You don't want little kids seeing all that stuff. But we still wanted them to have access to the internet and to be able to search and to do things, but we wanted them to do it safely. So we set up a proxy server. So any of that content that was requested would get filtered out it would never come back into the network. That way, it wouldn't be displayed and we were protecting our end users, which just happened to be the children. 
So you can see proxy servers can do a couple different things for us. They can hide our network. Uh, we can use it as a firewall even, right? We, uh, we can set rules up on a proxy server and block traffic again in or out. We can do content filtering with the proxy server as well. Uh, we can also cache things with a proxy server. So let's say um, you had lots of requests to a particular website. Well, instead of having the traffic go out over the LAN, over the WAN, uh, out your ISP and out to the internet and all the way back, and you have hundreds and hundreds of connections, you may have a proxy server that caches some of that information. Now, I can't see that being as relevant as it was you know, 10, 15 years ago because of the web 2.0 and dynamic websites. It's always changing now. You know, think about caching somebody's blog. Well, it's gonna change in two hours because they're gonna write something else on there. So you're gonna have to go back out to the web and bring that information back. So they may not be used as caching tools as, they, as much as they used to be, but it is still possible. Mainly we use them to hide our internal network and for content filtering and firewall purposes. Again, so they're doing something on our behalf. Some other technologies I want you to be aware of. A web application firewall, or a WAF. Now this controls HTTP messages. It is designed only to protect your web servers. You don't put a WAF in front of a file server or DNS or put it on the perimeter Bring it in close. Bring it in close to your HTTP servers, your web servers, because it's going to be looking at those messages and protecting your web services. We have a web security gateway. Now this guy can protect from inappropriate content as well. So if you don't want employees or staff or family members for that matter to look at inappropriate content, a web security gateway can help with that. Something else it can do is help with data loss prevention, DLP. That is also part of spillage, right? So somebody is accessing data that they may not supposed to be, or it could be um, accidental, right? Somebody doesn't mean to, but that data could still get out. We don't want sensitive, proprietary, confidential, secret, top secret. We don't want that data leaving our network. So a web security gateway could help prevent that. It can also scan for malicious code. So this guy actually does quite a bit, right? Pretty good little piece of technology. So that malicious code, looking for that malware, viruses, trojans, rootkits, all that bad stuff that attackers are trying to get into our network so they can take control, do that malicious activity. Web security gateway could be a good line of defense for us. We could also have something called a VPN concentrator. Now we talked about virtual private networking a little bit. Well, we're building that tunnel, right? I could be on the road, say in a hotel, or like I said earlier, um, when I'm in an airport, I will VPN back to my home network because I feel more secure about that. But what if say I owned a corporation or you own a corporation and headquarters is you know based in, uh, I don't know, Denver, Colorado. All right, and you have road warriors. You have hundreds of salesmen, uh, IT staff, engineering around the United States. And they're in hotels and airports and teleworking and working, you know, working from home or in different locations, maybe remote offices. But there's services at the headquarters that they have to have all the time. Well, we could have hundreds of VPN connections coming in, right? Might not be the best idea. So uh, let's say we have our headquarters in Denver and we have a branch office with 50 employees uh, in Los Angeles and they need to access our data. Well, we might not want 50 separate VPN connections. What we will do is set up what they call VPN concentrators. Put one in Denver and one in Los Angeles and they will concentrate that signal between the two. Okay, so you're taking all of those VPN connections and aggregating them down into one uh, pipe, if you will. So this centralizes your VPN access. 
And this probably works better with the branch office headquarters scenario that I was talking about because a VPN concentrator has to talk to another VPN concentrator. You can't have a VPN concentrator sitting out there just with its arms wide open and accepting connections from every other VPN connection. So it's VPN concentrator to concentrator. So that would work very well. A good thing about this is that you can have authentication and encryption. Yay security. That's what we want. We want people to have to be authenticated and then that data in transit, encryption, protecting our data. That's what we want. VPN concentrators can do that for us. We can also have a URL filter, that uniform resource locator. Now, this is a list of sites to either allow or we can deny. That's quite simply all that it really does. It looks and says, wait a minute, you're not supposed to go to that particular website. I'm going to say no, because uh, it's in my filter and it's under deny. We can do content inspection, which is actually looking at the page's content and say, well, you squeaked by the URL filter. You got clever maybe. Maybe you put in the IP address instead of the something.com. So you squeaked past the filter, but now a content inspection says, oh, wait a minute, that's an adult website. You're not supposed to be on that adult website. That's against corporate policy. That's a no-no. So we can have content inspection that looks and sees what you're looking at. Could look for keywords, could look for graphics, could look for whatever content that we set up. And different filters, uh, you know, look for different things. We can also have malware inspection. That's great to protect our organization, to protect our network and our end devices, because what it's looking for is malware in the connection. It's in addition to maybe antivirus that you would have on your system. So all of these other technologies are great when it comes to protecting our organization. At least they're great in my opinion. So we talked about these networking devices and all the media that we have connecting them together, the twisted pair, untwisted pair, uh, unshielded twisted pair, excuse me, uh, fiber optics. However, we're connecting all that together, but where's the other end of the cable going? Well, it's gonna go to end devices. So we also have to have endpoint security. And if you think about it so far, we've talked a lot about defense in depth, but we've talked about our security policies. We just got through talking about our networking devices so we can have a router with an ACL. We can have a firewall. We can have the DMZ. We can have switches uh, with port security. We can have anti-malware, content inspection, WAFs, web security gateways. We have all this out here protecting us. Now we're down here to the endpoint security. Up-to-date antivirus, up-to-date anti-malware software will help protect the endpoint. The endpoint is the end of the communication, the end of the cable, right? Where the end user is sitting. So when it comes to endpoint security, there's never such thing as too much unless you have <laughs> antivirus or anti-malware that conflicts with another program. That's the only way I can see that it would be too much. We want to have a configured and operational host-based firewall. Now, most modern operating systems that you can get today, they have that built in already, right? So you don't have to go get another one, though you can if you feel more secure, if you like a particular vendor, or you've already have a site license, or you've already paid for one, legally from another vendor, then yeah, put that on there. There's no rule saying you can't have two firewalls. Now, the more firewalls you have, the more levels of defense that you have may um, trick yourself into blocking traffic that you don't want to. So you have to be diligent in how you set up your firewall rules. We want to harden the configuration of that operating system, of that endpoint, that laptop, that desktop, that server. We want to harden it down, get rid of unneeded services, get rid of unneeded or unused programs, applications that may have been installed on that system. When we have services running that's unneeded, we are opening more of those ports, more of those doors. 
We are making ourselves more vulnerable to attack because now we're making ourselves a little bit bigger. We're making ourselves a little bit more visible. You know, our security footprint is getting larger. Our attack surface is getting larger. We want to close that stuff off. We want to get small, like my football coach told me all the time. Get small, right? We want to get small. It's harder to attack. So make sure we're hardening those services, hardening those configurations. We want to patch and maintain your operating system. I can't preach this one enough. I don't understand why people don't do this because uh, it happens a lot. There are automated tools out there that will patch your operating system for you. If you don't want it to do it for you, it will go download them and have them ready for your approval even. So you don't even have to manually say, okay, go download it, and then you sit there for 15, 20, 30 minutes, depending on how many you have, and then you have to wait. It will do it automatically. I yet to hear a relevant excuse of why I don't patch my operating system. Other than I have proprietary software on here, and last time I downloaded an update, it made it crash. Okay, I got you. Let it download it and have it staged and ready to go. So you can come in and approve the patches that do need to be on there, maybe not the ones that conflict. Because I guarantee it, there's more than just one patch out there that you may have missed. I've yet to see a, a, a patch come through, through the week, where it's just one. Uh, maybe I'm not paying super close enough attention, but it's usually more than one comes through weekly. So we want to make sure we patch it. These four things, endpoint security, I can't preach on this one enough. I can't stress it enough. We need up-to-date antivirus, up-to-date anti-malware, configured and operational host-based firewalls. Harden your configuration. Make yourself small. Have it patched and maintain your operating system. Make sure it's running efficiently. Get rid of unneeded programs and applications. Why use the resources? Why make yourself more vulnerable? Don't need to do that. Also for endpoint security, you know, I'm preaching about and talking about desktops and laptops. What about mobile devices? Has anybody ever given any thought to that? You know, tablets, your cell phones nowadays, right? You can run an office from a cell phone pretty much in these smartphones that we have. And some of these cell phones, I mean, they got screens that are gigantic. They come with pens, right? You can write on them. You can run a business from that. But what happens if it's lost or stolen or broken? I've dropped one, right? I've cracked a, a cell phone in my time. I'm sure I'm not the only one. But what about these mobile systems? They're endpoints as well. They need security. We need abilities to, say, remotely wipe something. A cell phone is swiped, right? Somebody left it at a restaurant and it's, it was taken. You went back for it. Nobody knows where it is. It's completely gone. Do you have the ability now, because you had business data on there, proprietary or sensitive data, let's say, do you have the ability to contact that phone and remotely wipe whatever data is on there? You should. Most updated current smartphones have that capability. If not, you can get apps for that capability. What about tracking the device? Maybe that data on there is something you don't want to wipe. You don't have a backup copy of yet. Can you track the device? Can you find out where it is? Most updated uh, service providers have that capability for you nowadays too. Uh, again, you can get apps to load on these devices to track and find where they are by GPS, if they're connected to Wi-Fi, if they're still on cellular signals, what about encryption? You have to encrypt your data. Now, some devices support it, some don't. Um, I, I gotta be honest, I'm not super privy to that. I know mine does. However, uh, some may not. You can get applications that help you with software encryption. You can lock down certain folders. You can lock down certain areas. I do know that. So you can encrypt it in a way to protect your applications, to protect that data possibly. Because if somebody does swipe it, what if they can unlock it? 
What if they were social engineering you or shoulder surfing and they were standing behind you in line waiting to be seated for lunch and they noticed that when you picked up your phone, they noticed your pin. It's not hard, right? You can just look and people just hit it, right? And you just watch the four digits, six digits, whatever it is. You wait for the opportune time or maybe one just drops in their lap and you got up and left. They noticed that you left your cell phone. They walk to the restroom, walk by, swipe it. It's gone. They know your passcode so they can get into your device. Well, if I can get into your device and I have malicious intent, just like if I was going to break into your home, the first thing I'm going to disable is the alarm system or try to. The first thing I'm going to do with your mobile device is put it in airplane mode and probably turn off the Wi-Fi. What is that going to prevent? That's right, you finding your phone. If you can't communicate it through cellular signals with cell towers and you can't connect to it through Wi-Fi, you can't track it, you can't remote wipe it. So what do I hope you have on that phone? Encryption, right. You may never get the phone back, you may never get the device back, but at least your data is safe. If you use some type of encryption, it's probably gonna take the attacker a long time, years, if not hundreds of years, depending on the encryption, to crack your code, to crack the key to get that data. So I can't stress enough how important encryption is. Endpoint device encryption is important, not just on your desktops and your laptops, but tablets, those mobile devices like your cell phones. Another thing about them that I don't have listed on here is antivirus and anti-malware for those devices as well. They can get viruses, they can get malware on them. Uh, not to call one particular out, but I've seen, uh, you know, security reports and Android, right? One particular year, I think it grew by like 2,400% the malware on those devices. Well, that concerns me. So I have antivirus and anti-malware on my devices because I want that endpoint security. Now, what about content distribution networks, CDNs? Now, these are large distributed systems of servers deployed in multiple data centers all around the internet, globally. They're all over the place. Now, the key enabling technology behind successful consumer-facing sites and uh, verticals such as media and entertainment, software download delivery, gaming, and e-commerce is this content distribution network. So think about popular streaming services that you have out there, like Netflix, okay? Netflix may be headquartered somewhere, I don't know where, probably on the West Coast, but do you think that customers on the East Coast are streaming media all the way across the United States? Or do you think Netflix, the company, has set up something like a content distribution network so when you request something, it looks for the closest uh, network or data center to your particular region, and that's where you're pulling your data from? Probably so. Amazon has web services that do this. Microsoft and their Office 365, they have content distribution networks, all global. So no matter where you are, you can get the same content, but you'll get it faster and better and more efficiently from a data center that's closest to you. So we'll give content owners and publishers the ability to rapidly scale to meet increasing user demands. So you may have one of these in your organizations. So the goal of a CDN is to serve content to end users with high availability and high performance. The closer we are to that dictates it's gonna be higher performance. I don't have to stream it or copy or move that information uh, very far or across countries. 
Now, coming up, next we're gonna continue on with domain four, starting with design and establish secure communication channels.